it to another person? Like, how is yeah. it actually transmitted? I think mean, people are getting used to COVID and how that happens. But for monkeypox, how, how does that work? Yeah, so with monkeypox, it's one of those things where I guess, like, if I, the easiest way to make a comparison here would be like, if you can get COVID from sharing an elevator with somebody, you could get monkeypox from sharing a cup of coffee with somebody over the span of a couple hours, right? So, it can spread airborne. It's a little bit more slow going than coronavirus is airborne. Um, and while this varies, and there's still more research that needs to be done into this, generally speaking, if you get it through an airborne route, it's gonna have a little bit longer of an incubation period than if you get from close physical contact. Um, but then you can also get it from physical contact. Another common mode of spread is through like fabrics and stuff like that. So if you're sharing a couch with somebody, or you're sharing laundry with somebody, or you're sharing like hand towels and things like that. Um, so there's like a decent amount of household spread that goes on. And then obviously like close physical intimate contact is gonna be like the most like sort of rapid and extreme. Uh, in terms of like the onset, and it's gonna be like the easiest way to spread it. Basically, the closer you get and the sweatier mm. you are, the more likely <laughs> it is to spread. Okay, so advice to everyone, if you have to make love, don't do it vigorously, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, um, no, but it, but it is serious, but 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 how serious? So we, we have we had kind of an idea of of how how bad COVID was, how it affected you, likelihood of death, which sorts of people were at risk of that. And we've had to modulate that over time with the vaccine and with different variants. So how worrisome is monkeypox? How severe is it? How how does it look? Can it kill you? That sort of thing. Yeah. So the answer is incredibly so. And so I guess like there's a little bit of a question right now. Because the symptoms that people are showing right now, and this is sort of a good news, bad news situation, seem to be relatively mild compared to outbreaks of monkeypox that we've seen in the past, which is in some sense good news. But remember, we're on a relative scale here, and monkeypox can have between a 1 and 10% mortality rate. Another factor of monkeypox that's important to understand is it can leave you with a lot of permanent scarring. And then another factor to consider with monkeypox is that especially in children under the age of eight, but children in general tend to have a higher mortality rate. And this is something that it really I think needs to be emphasized that right now, while it isn't spreading among kids for the most part, in other places where it's endemic, it does spread a lot among kids. And we're seeing sort of a coincidence of community. So like the, the community that is being most impacted by it right now is gay men. But there's nothing inherent to gay men that makes them more susceptible to monkeypox. It's really just a coincidence of community. Much like coronavirus started in China, doesn't mean that China was like uniquely susceptible to coronavirus. It just means that sort of out of coincidence, yeah. it was their community that got hit first. And so understanding and all, that. Well, and really fast, I mean, you're 100% right. And yet some attempted to make it all about China. They tried to create a narrative around that origin. And I know that's part of what we want to talk about is that attempt to sort of define a narrative early on. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts about how that's working with monkeypox. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And the last thing I'll say about the impacts is that like the permanent scarring is something that's like really it, it's it's very, very bad and very, very tragic, especially for like young children. And it's one of those things where if we don't deal with it quickly, a lot of people might get over monkeypox, but might have to deal with permanent scarring. And a 1% mortality rate is a bit higher than the mortality rate of coronavirus. And there's no guarantee that the mild symptoms that we're seeing on a relative scale hold up. And there's no guarantee, um, you know, there's no guarantee that it doesn't get worse, basically. And so this is just sure. something that we should understand that, like, we could start seeing very significant mortality rates in the coming days. But yes, regarding the messaging, there's a lot of people right now that are trying to frame this as something that is exclusively affecting gay men, or you know, more sort of like sinisterly, they try to say that it's coming from gay men. But the reality is, it is a coincidence of community, right? Um, some of the first instances that, that were, um, I think it was in the Netherlands, it was two raves that were identified as like initial spreader events where people were engaging in sexual intercourse after these raves. Um, and, but the thing is, 
that's really a coincidence. It could have easily happened at like a Phoebe Bridgers concert or it could have happened at like your local gym, right? And that's those are the types of things to be alert for is that like, you know, obviously like um, you know, the local gym or like swimming pool is going to be a potential high risk location because people are getting sweaty and I think you and I both know not everybody is going to do a careful diligent job of wiping down the equipment yep. and people need to like quarantine for like a month, right? Until the symptoms Jeez. go away, right? They'll need to isolate. And I think we all understand why a lot of people aren't gonna be doing that. Another thing that's critical to understand is that some of the first symptoms that people see are just like a general fever and flu-like symptoms. And the rash doesn't start to appear until like a day or two later. And this is where it becomes especially dangerous in terms of the spread because if like, if you, I mean, we all know children, right? We all know children. Are children immediately going to go to their parents if they're a little bit feverish and have like a rash, right? It doesn't necessarily start off with monkeypox all over you, right? It can start off with what looks like a pimple or what looks like, you know, just like a breakout or like a small scab or something. And so yeah. these are things to just really be aware of. Yeah. And uh, so I wanted to ask you about. More about that narrative because I, I know we had talked. You were spreading something I think on Twitter where, like, it, it is one thing, a disgusting thing, early on in the pandemic with COVID to have Trump talking about the China flu and Kung flu and stuff like that. Um, but but people know that he's awful, that he's a terrible partisan, you know, extremist. But but you, I believe, were spreading an article where the AP, the Associated Press itself. Seemed to be completely ignoring the fact that the you know initial spread being amongst gay men is it's happenstance. It happened there. It could have happened anywhere, and they seem to be jumping aboard this narrative. And they're interpreted as being a much more neutral sort of just purveyor of accurate fact-checked information. So it seems like that would be much more likely to spread. And and based on what I've seen on social media, I feel like a lot of people. To varying levels, some are more aggressive about it, some are just passive, but they do seem to think that this is a thing that's in the LGBTQ community, and and maybe they think that that's bad, but that's what it is. What do you think about that, and how do we fight back against that narrative? And and what yeah. happens if we don't? Yeah, I mean, okay, so starting off with like like the AP, they went even so far as to refer to it as an STI, which it is most definitely not, right? Monkeypox is not an STI, right? Um, you can, if you're sitting down face to face with somebody for up to three hours, like that is is considered a pretty risky exposure, right? And so that's definitely not as intimate as sexual intercourse. I think we all have shared cups of coffee with people that we wouldn't do that with, right? Like I think we all understand that there's a huge discrepancy right there. Um, then obviously like the spreading on surfaces and stuff like that. And the reason why it's really concerning the messaging is because when it comes to the response, when it comes to response, we need to understand that general practitioners are not necessarily epidemiologists. And even some epidemiologists are focused on some diseases or another. Like I just out of my own personal interest, um, like covering the neg neglected tropical diseases. It's it's something that I've always sort of had like an interest in. And I focused on it because it intersects so much with climate change and some of the other reporting that, um, that I do. And it's, I think, very, very critical. Um, Monkeypox is definitely one of those, and there's decades of research that shows how it can spread. Um, like, for example, another big concern is that you know if monkeypox gets into the wastewater, then you can get rodents infected with monkeypox, and rodents can be big spreaders of monkeypox. Um, and so, like, all of a sudden, it could become endemic. And so, the reason why this is important, this messaging, is because while we do want to put people on high alert if they're at a community, if they're in a community that is most directly impacted right now. We also need to make sure we're casting a broad enough net. And because there's a lot of doctors who aren't necessarily experts on monkeypox, they're just clinicians that you know are not going to suspect monkeypox, right? Monkeypox is, you know, up until this point, a fairly rare thing. And so they're gonna think horses and not zebras. And yeah. so when you put out this messaging, you will have a lot of cis het folks um, who will show up to a doctor with symptoms that could be monkeypox that a doctor might not think is monkeypox. And when you have that as your response, Instead of getting ahead of the virus and sequestering it with like vaccines and like ring vaccinations and sort of different community protections, you end up trailing the virus and you end up being behind. And trailing a virus is never gonna stop a pandemic. You really need to get around it and prevent it from spreading. 
Um, and then as far as like how to combat it, I mean, I really just think it's it is dependent on having like, you know, I think at this point journalists and like journalists who are willing to reach out to the epidemiologists who are sort of screaming at the top of their lungs that this is what's going on. Um, because, you know, there's gonna be a lot of misinformation out there and there's gonna be a lot of people who there's gonna be a lot of people who are sort of like willing to like jump on the line. Um, because like ultimately, if you have a lot of people that are only looking for monkeypox among the gay community and they're only testing people in the gay community, then you're gonna have a data, you're gonna have data that says that it's mostly gay folks that are being impacted, which contradicts the decades of data that is collected from you know Central Africa and West Africa, where this has been endemic for decades. Yeah. yeah and and when we're caught between you know the obvious high stakes of if it spreads, it potentially could have a high mortality rate. Right? So the stakes of not catching it are really high. And on the other hand, that as you've laid out, it seems like a thing that you could catch if you do things right. That's such a bad combination of things to have. So um, look, th this is a serious thing. We're, we're gonna have to learn a lot more about it. We're gonna hopefully, you know, uh, people can get educated about this. This is just sort of a, a basic intro to it. And I, I especially wanted to get your thoughts about um, you know some of the narratives that are being spread because I don't want people to just uncritically accept them. Um, but but I do appreciate you joining us and helping lay all that out. I feel like you covered a lot of ground, uh, Ben. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. If you don't mind me like pointing out like one more thing, because this is really important, mm -hmm. right? And like the response right now that we're seeing seems to be slow going. There's actually a report that came out from the New York Times that they adopted a wait and see approach, which is really terrifying, especially because there are two different vaccines. And for whatever reason, they're only rolling out one of the vaccines, which is the newer one, which granted has like lower side effects and it's a lot easier. But there's another vaccine that the CDC has stockpiled, right? It's called ACAM mm -hmm. 2000. It can be really annoying to manage, right? When you get the vaccine, you get a blister that you have to keep t like take care of that you can't like really touch, and you have to like cover it to make sure that because it's a live virus vaccine, so it doesn't spread to other people. But we have a hundred oh, million geez. of those. We have a hundred million of those vaccines, right? So we have enough to like vaccinate a ton of people, but it is riskier and some people can't get it. But this is why it's so important to get ahead of the virus because if the vaccine that we have stockpiled that we have a hundred million doses of, right, can't be given to everybody, then to not use a blended approach to me seems irresponsible when it comes to the vaccines. Yeah. No, that that seems very reasonable. I did not know that uh, about the side effects of that that vaccine. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to educate myself, and I I think the audience should too. Um, but again, Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Really do appreciate it.